We're just about finished with a huge renovation in the backyard of this house. Our homeowners had a big grass lawn that took a lot of time and water to maintain. We replaced it with lots of drought tolerant plants, trees, and pathways to create a backyard botanical garden. We'll go through our finished design and tell you how we did it next on Step Outside. The owners of this home were tired of maintaining their large Bermuda grass lawn. It had some great features, a nice swimming pool, a spa, a ramada, and a deck with a fireplace. So we kept everything they liked and got rid of all the grass, then added a lot of desert-loving plants and trees, and topped it all off with pathways, stream beds, and a 12-foot water feature. When Step Outside returns, we'll take a look at the plants and trees we used to turn a big city backyard into a desert botanical oasis. Stay tuned. When we started this job, this was just a big flat lot. Looking at it now, you'd never know it. We took out all the grass, and to add interest, we built up some mounds. Then we brought in hundreds of drought tolerant plants and lots of desert adapted trees. Now let me give you a little tour of our desert botanical garden here. We've got a great assortment of plants for color. Starting with these salvia gregii, the hummingbirds really love these flowers, but one thing you have to be aware of, this particular plant, it doesn't want full sun all the time, which is why I've got it planted here in the partial shade of this Desert Museum Palo Verde. This is a deer grass here, which will give us a little soft spiky accent. Underneath this Desert Museum Palo Verde, I have a chuparosa, which is a native shrub. The hummingbirds also like that, but if you ever watch this plant or look for it in the desert, you'll normally, again, see it growing underneath the canopy of trees. In fact, this almost likes to become a vine up into the trees, so we want to get that natural effect. Along our natural stream here, which is going to hold some water when it rains here on the site, we put plants that want a little bit more water. These happen to be rain lilies. And they're really cool because in the monsoon season, they actually send up a spring bouquet like of flowers that happen. Only it happens usually in July and August. And they like to grow along the edge of the stream like this. Now, over here in the sun, we've got some more great color. This is Ruralia Katy. It's a tight little ground cover. It's got some really nice pink flowers on it. Don't plant it if you have rabbits, though, because they love that plant if they can get to it. Our backyard, we don't have that issue here, especially when we have our gates closed. This plant is actually called Budlia, or butterfly bush. And it has these orange kind of globular-like flowers, different texture with the leaf, different color. And it'll get to about three feet tall here and about three feet wide. And then down in front over here, we've got the Gold Mound Lantana. This is a great ground cover, loves the sun, you can get a lot of flowers with it. These five plants will eventually grow into one big mass, and in the middle of those will be the spiky accent of the Hesper aloe that'll come out of there, and that again blooms in the springtime and gives more for our hummingbirds to come after. There's another little plant here. It doesn't look like much right now. That's guara, but it does get really pretty pink flowers on it in the middle of the summer. Now, we've got the Desert Museum Palo Verdes here. I love these trees because they can get big and give us a really big canopy, pretty bark color to them. And I've got the Chilean mesquites over here. Ultimately, all of these trees will grow together and kind of create almost an umbrella-like canopy to walk in the shade underneath in our path here. And what you have to be aware of is gardens are dynamic. That means they're always changing as things grow. When the shade from the canopy of these trees gets in here, these lantana may not want to live here anymore. They'll be great for the next three, four years. Ultimately, though, we may have to come back and change this plant out to a more shade-loving variety. But that's the beauty of working in your garden and making things change with you as they grow. Now, we're just about ready to get our water feature up and running. We put in our PVC liner, put a concrete shell over that, then we brought in about 15 tons of these surface select granite boulders, carefully placed them all, and then filled the voids in with what we call granite crete. It's kind of a mixture of our decomposed granite, color, and mortar to kind of fill in all the open voids between the boulders. Now this pond here, this is the lower pond that I'm in and the upper pond's up there, will hold about, oh, 500 gallons of water when it's all said and done. 
but we wanna be able to move that water from this lower pond up there and have it cascade over these boulders. So we're using this, this is called a torpedo pump. It even looks like a torpedo, but it's a pretty indestructible pump. I like to use these. It can actually be in the water, submersible, or out of the water in a box if you don't want it submersible. We're gonna have it in the water here. And all we do with this is we have a little intake screen that just screws onto the end of this pump here. And then we have a discharge that goes on with this hose that'll attach onto here. And then once we get that all in place, we'll run the cord out through another pipe that we've run up and hidden through all the rocks and plugged into an outlet up behind the pond itself. So we'll get this going and have you take a look at it. How do you water a desert garden? We'll tell you next on Step Outside. What was once a pretty stark looking backyard is now a lush desert garden. The new landscape is low maintenance, but not maintenance free. And although it's zero scape, there will be some watering involved. Now in our backyard, we have a wide variety of plants and trees, and they each have their own watering requirement. Like this tree here, we put two four gallon per hour emitters to this tree. Now it's young, and as it gets older, it may need some more watering. The five gallon shrubs got one two gallon per hour emitter. The one gallon shrubs got one one gallon per hour emitter. The beauty of a drip system like this is it allows us the flexibility to put different amounts of water to each plant as they need it. Whenever you spend the time and money to install a new landscape, you need to make sure you have an irrigation system that will deliver just the right amount of water to your plants and trees. Before we installed our desert botanical garden, we got together with the irrigation experts at Horizon Distributors to get their help selecting the best parts for our new system. Horizon has also helped with the irrigation needs out at the community of Verado. Located in Buckeye and nestled in the foothills of the White Tank Mountains, Verado is really a town within a town, having its own tree-lined main street, community parks, and a golf course, all requiring well-planned irrigation systems. We took a trip to this oasis in the desert to meet with Verado Community Services Manager Scott Rowan and Pat Johnston of Horizon to find out how they're handling the community's irrigation needs. So Scott, how many acres of irrigated land would you say you have here in the community of Verado? Well, right now we're at about 220 acres. Um, of that, we have uh, 40 that are turf. We have about 50 that are native wash areas that we maintain as well as, as put a little irrigation to to make sure we we uh, keep the trees healthy, keep the and, trees stuff, yeah. healthy and, and then we have about 125 acres of what we would call low water use, zero scape, DG type landscape uh, throughout the community. Well, what public spaces are being irrigated? Public spaces are tree lined streets, which is a big part of what we are here at Verado, as well as parks. We try to design the community so that the folks come out the front door, they have a park, they have a shady street. Describe some of the water issues you've had here at Verado. There's been a couple of them, and it has more to do with the landscape, especially this size going in this fast. You really have to manage the water to make sure you get your plant material to live and not overuse it. We have 144 controllers out here and upwards of 4,000 valves that need to be managed from one location. So we've gone to a state-of-the-art system to make sure we do that. Now I know you've partnered with Horizon, and they've helped us on some of our projects. What have they done for you here? Horizon's been a great partner. Um, they've been with us from the day one stages of planning through design, through construction, through the installation, and now even the maintenance phase are still with us since 2003. Everything helping us design the right system for what we need out here from a commercial standpoint and water management standpoint to be in there to make sure it gets installed correctly. Um, it does no good to put the right system in if it isn't put in correctly. So they've worked with us all the way through um, to this day, as a matter of fact, as far as new technology that continues to come out in the irrigation and water management world. Well, you got a beautiful community out here at Verado and really appreciate you inviting us to come out and take a look. Well, thanks, Pete. So, Pat, I was talking to Scott about all the water issues out here at Verado. When you have a project like Verado, where do you even start? Well, big projects like Verado or your home, you always start with the water source. What, what do you have available for you to be able to water? In Verado, it's a little bit different, of course, because of the size. So from looking at your water source, then you go to what type of plants are you going to water, 
and then how are you going to get it done and how fast do you need to get it done. So you need to have a system that, uh, a controlling system that is flexible enough to take in all those different types of micro environments that you might experience around a project this size. You provided us with one of your new smart controllers for our new install project, but if a homeowner has an existing controller and they want to upgrade to one of these more water efficient ones, what's involved? Safety first. We want to isolate that power. We want to uh, locate where the circuit breaker is that provides power to our controller. Uh, second, then we, it's a simple process of removing the valve wires and the power wires and then removing the controller, uh, installing up the new one uh, with anchors and uh, bring in those valve wires and the power wires back again and we go ahead and program it. Now there's also some other components that might be involved with that though. Absolutely. Uh, some smart controllers will use a secondary device such as a rain switch or a temperature sensor that will need to be hung on the side of the house, usually up at the eave. We want to make sure that we don't have water runoff from the roof when it does rain going right into our rain switch. That might affect the readings that it's putting out. So I know there's some advice actually that a homeowner can give to their professional and that's that they do their research and they get their products at the right place and not at some big box store. Absolutely, Pete. Uh, most big box stores around the corner from you aren't going to carry these products. Um, you can always visit uh, various websites you know, for manufacturers, but we encourage you to go to horizononline.com as well as your professional be able to research these things and we can come out and even do an on-site analysis and help your professional be able to complete the job right. Coming up, keeping plants and trees looking their best throughout the year. Installing plants and trees on a property like this makes a dramatic difference. They add shade, color, and interest. Now with all these plants, you may think I've created a maintenance nightmare, but we're really after that natural look. And so really this garden only needs to be pruned maybe three or four times a year. Now, these trees, the desert trees, can have a little bit of mess to them. The mesquites and the palaverdes, both are gonna bloom in the spring. So they're gonna drop some flower litter and some seed litter, more so with the mesquites on the seeds. If we get a real cold winter, these trees can lose their leaves, but it's got to be really, really cold, a lot of frost. Otherwise, most of your desert trees are evergreen. So it's not a lot of litter. It's not like we get into the fall and everything drops and you gotta rake up leaves. But I think just occasionally if you're out here raking up some of the leaf litter, and it's no big deal to leave some of that on the ground because that's actually healthy for our whole ecosystem here. Now a few of the other things, some of the shrubs, again, you just want to be able to let them grow in their natural shape. We have get like these salvia gregii. If you got a little wild hair that's just coming off, again, walking around, just doing a little bit of snipping, a little bit of deadheading, and that's really all it takes. This tree right here, Hakaranda, we don't want these guys growing off of the base, so we just come back cut those quick right to the main trunk. One of my pet peeves, however, is when you see drift shrubs like this, this happens to be silver cassia, and you see the landscapers get out with hedge clippers and prune them into little puff balls, do not let them do that. You're cutting off the growing ends, that's where the flowers form, you'll never get any color, you eventually build up so much wood in the shrub that you have to get rid of it and replace it. We want that natural look. So again, if you got a little wild hair, just clip it off. Let the shrub have its whole natural shape. Deadheading on things that flower, like this Hesperallo, of course, after it's all done blooming, we just come back in here to the base of the plant and cut these guys off. But keep the natural shape of the plant. He'll send up more blooms next spring for us. It takes more than just plants to create our garden. We brought in over 15 tons of this quarter inch minus decomposed granite that we're using for our paths. We brought over 70 tons of our half inch granite that we're using to cover all the other landscape spaces. And then we brought in about 20 tons of our riprap, our little bit larger rock that we're using in all our little stream bed areas. A lot of different texture going on with that. In addition to that, we actually brought in about 25 tons of surface select granite boulders that we've used at the edge of stairs we're using on our water feature, several other areas in, that, in the garden. 
And then our main paving material in the backyard, which kind of unifies all the deck spaces, is our flagstone. We put that over the existing cool deck, we put that over the existing patios, and we put it onto our new patio areas in front of the water feature and over by the fireplace area. Now underneath this covered patio, the paving material used to be just a common red brick. We actually took the brick out and there was concrete underneath there, so we put the flagstone over the top of that. Remember, flagstone on our project here is kind of our unifying paving material. Now out here, this all used to be cool deck, both here and here around the pool. We just put the flagstone right over the top of the cool deck, even on the face of the step here as we go from the lower patio to the upper patio. Now, one of the nice things I like about flagstone is all the wide variety of colors. We actually used three different colors on this job. We used a little bit of the desert rose, we used some of the classic oak, and some of the buckskin. And as you can see from the variety of colors that we have here, it really shows off the individualness of each stone. In addition, I used a gray grout so that would even more so show the individual stones off. If you use one color of flagstone and try to match it with the grout, it can almost look like colored concrete in a hot sun. Now speaking of hot sun, you might think this material is too hot to walk on barefoot. In the middle of the summer, maybe, but one nice thing about flagstone is it's porous. So if you wanted to come out with the hose or just kind of wet it down a little bit, it will actually soak up that water and kind of slowly evaporate it off like an evaporative cooler and it'll be very cool to your bare feet. We have a lot of green and tan in the yard and we wanted to add some contrast, a kind of intense pop of color. We're going to get that with flowers. Now this is one of the most colorful parts of our yard. We're actually having an annual bed here between the pool and the house to give them a real splash of color. It's a little higher water use, but it's well worth it. They can get a seasonal change, probably change these annuals out two, maybe three times a year, constantly keep some color in the yard that way. Now what I've got going here is in the center of the bed I've got these pink geraniums. And they'll get up to about two and a half feet tall or so. And in front of them, kind of completely surrounding them, offsetting with the white petunias, they'll stay a little bit lower and completely fill this in. And then right along the edge, I'm going to have my guys go ahead and plant this multicolored lobelia. So it's a really low carpet of color all the way around and offset the other two colors we've already got going there. Now, for watering this, this is on a separate valve, and it's got these little microjet mist emitters. These are adjustable to adjust the size of the spray, but they keep this whole area nice and moist, which is what these flowers want. Up next, a look at our outdoor lighting. Now we've got our great botanical garden with all these neat people paths, and we want people to walk out in this and enjoy it but we also want them to walk out here at night. So we've added some low volt lighting throughout the garden. Every place we have a step, like this here, we've put a recessed step light into the face of the step so that it'll illuminate where you change grade. Now, as you walk a little bit further down the path, we have these little copper walk lights. They don't look like much, but they do put out a great pool of light. You don't see the light source. And we're not lighting it up like an airport runway. We've got one here and then maybe another 30 feet, another one. So you go from a pool of light to a pool of light. And these will eventually patina to an old copper penny look. Now, on all of the trees, we've added up lights so that we can illuminate the canopy of the tree and we'll get a little bit of added bounce light effect from that light spilling back down into the garden and onto the paths. Well, that's it. All the pieces are in place and we're done with our remodel. Before, our homeowners lived with a grass field yard, big enough to accommodate a football game and then some. Now, they've got their own desert botanical garden, large enough to do some major entertaining. The swimming pool's been livened up with custom carved elephant fountains. The patio has gone from brick and cool deck to an elegant flagstone surface. The grass that used to take all weekend to maintain is gone, replaced by desert trees, plants, pathways, and stream beds. And what used to be an unused area just off the Ramada is now a calming waterfall. This backyard has gone from livable to lively.
Pete had some great ideas to begin with and I think he was responsive to what our original need was. When we were entertaining before, people usually stayed by the pool and that was fun, but nothing ever really drew people out into the yard. And now with these pathways and the patios and the various little places to sit down, it really invites people to come out and explore. The best part is that it is very relaxing to come out first thing in the morning and after work. And you can be in any corner and every, it's, flowers are different and, and it's very relaxing. Each week on Step Outside, we show you some of the endless possibilities that await you just beyond your door. So come on, step outside and enjoy the view. I'm Pete Cure. See you next time. It's just like full of eye candy. Everywhere you look, there's something wonderful to see. You know what I really like about this yard is all of the different little vignettes that you have. Yeah. I mean, you've got water over there. It's really relaxing. It's just a great place to stroll and walk around.